All right, so this is lecture one's overview. We're going to look at digital embedded systems, We're going to look at information representation, so that would include different signal and number systems that we may use. We're going to look at simple binary arithmetic and operations and conversions, and then we're going to look at the binary and decimal and alphanumeric codes. These lectures will be broken up into four parts, and in each one of the lectures there will be a number of slides, 10 to 20 slides or so, and then after that there will be a small set of quiz questions which you can then test your knowledge with. So let's get into the first part which is digital and embedded systems. So first of all let's think about what is a digital system. There are many digital systems in our world and in around us, but in general you'd say that a digital system is one that takes in some sort of discrete information as inputs and then it has a discrete internal information which we call in the system state and then it generates a set of discrete outputs. Inputs come in, information system itself, it's holding its system state so constantly being updated and checking it and then it outputs something. So maybe we might have some sort of push button. When we push the button then we have a little LED that goes on. And maybe when we push it once, uh, the system state says it's on, and then the light stays on, we let go of the button, we push it again, we check to see what the system state is, it was on, uh, and so now the discrete output is the, the light goes off. So the two main types of digital systems, one being where there's no state present, which is something like a combinational logic system. So therefore we just have some input, we have a function, and we have some output being a function of that input. In that case, there's no state held, there's no state present. It's irrelevant what the state of the system is. It simply goes off what the input is and what the function is. The other case is where there's some state present, and then the state might be updated discrete times with some sort of timer, and that would be a synchronous sequential system. Or if it's updated at any time whatsoever, so it doesn't require that clock, then it's asynchronous. We call that asynchronous sequential system. So in the case of the digital system which has a state present, the state is equal to a function of the state and the input, and the output is equal to a function of the state, or it can be a function of the state and the input. So in the previous example where we showed the, the push button, we could say that the one that doesn't store the state would be just the buttons pushed, and the light goes on, the button's released, the light goes off. So that's just a very simple input and irrelevant of the state and then an output. In the case where it actually depends upon the state, we can have different functionalities like we could push it once to make it go on uh, and then if it's on and we push it again, uh, then maybe we make it blink and if it's on and it's blinking, uh, then we push it again we maybe make it go off. So therefore we can use the fact that the system has some state to allow for a whole lot of different outputs because it's now a function of the system state as well as the input in this case. So here's a simple example of a digital system that has no state present. So you've probably seen these logic gates before. So we would say that if A is on or high or one and B is one, then C is also one. So this is an AND logic gate, but there's no system state. Simply changing the state of A or B will immediately change the state of C if that function uh, applies. So we can say that C is a function of both A and B, and in this case, it's A and B. So no state is stored, and C changes when either or both A and B change. In this case, C would change if A and B are both high, that would become high, would become one, so one, one gives a one. Then if either of these change to a zero, say A becomes zero and B is still one, then C equals zero. So let's think of a digital system example where the state is actually held. So something like a digital counter, like an odometer that would be in your car as you drive forwards, it's measuring the distance that you've traveled, and then keeping track of that on your odometer. So there is some count up input, and this would be, for example, the wheels on the car going around, uh, and then maybe one encoder tick 
saying that it's traveled one complete revolution and then we know that the because of the wheels diameter we know how far along the road that's traveled and therefore every number of count up ticks uh, will allow us to work out what sort of travel distance we've had in kilometers and then maybe there's another button which is a reset button this is obviously not on the the overall odometer for your car but most of them have a trip meter which tells you how far you've traveled on a certain trip and you can reset that one and often it gives you it in hundreds of meters as well so you might have decimal place here so in this digital system we have our count up and our reset as inputs for the system one of them is this is manually controlled the reset button and then the count up is perhaps you could call that automatic because it depends upon the car driving forward then you've got an output which is the visual display so in terms of the visual display that we show here uh, then we might have seven segment displays displaying each of these characters and so a seven segment display for a zero might be something like this And then we have the state, which is the value of the stored digits. So obviously what we're seeing as our output, this visual display is going to depend upon what the previous state was. So we might be driving up and we've gone from four to five to six. And it's also going to depend upon the count up. So the pulses that are coming from the encoder, say off the wheels. Uh, and then it's also would depend upon whether we've pushed the reset button or not. If we haven't pushed the reset button, we assume that this will continue to count up. If we have, then these should all be zeroed. So another example of a digital system is a digital computer. And this is obviously a much more complicated digital system. And it actually probably contains many digital systems inside it. But at a high level, what we have is the computer having some memory it has a cpu which does the central control a bus which allows this data to, to move around and then we have inputs and outputs to devices such as keyboards mice wi-fi microphone webcams and then outputs to things like an lcd screen or speakers wi-fi would also be an output another example might be portable hard drives which have input and output paths. If you think about a computer CPU or a bus speed, they generally talk in megahertz or gigahertz. So a question is, what does that actually mean? What are we talking here? And what it is, is this is the clock speed of it. So this is how fast the operations can happen one after another. And perhaps data can be processed at each of the clock cycles. We would call those synchronous inputs. But then an example of an asynchronous input is the keyboard input. So nothing happens until a key is pushed uh, and then that signal is pushed across the USB bus, say. So there's both synchronous and asynchronous inputs and outputs to this digital system. So when we think about an embedded system, we think about microcomputers or microcontrollers where a microcomputer would be an example of a microcontroller that also has some state stored. DSPs, digital signal processors, are also commonly found in embedded systems. And nowadays, particularly with smart electronics, computers are becoming an integral part of many products. Many things that in the past haven't actually required computers are now getting added functionality by adding some computing internally, like maybe a microwave that detects when the food is getting hot or the weight of the food or a dishwasher that actually senses how clean the water is as it's going through, or a washing machine that detects the weight of the clothes so that it can change the spin cycles. So all of these white goods and many others would have embedded systems inside them, some of which would just be purely microcontrollers, which would do some processing, DSPs for signal processing, or they would be microcomputers where they would have some state storage. So here's some examples, pretty pictures, so phones, basically a computer actually would have multiple digital systems inside it, but it would be an embedded, counted as an embedded system. An automobile, like a car or a bus, or would have things like GPS and digital radio and voice recognition and ABS braking, parking assisting. Each one of these would probably have its own control board, maybe talking to the car's main computer via some CAN bus, uh, but then each of the individually have their own embedded system to do some sort of specialist function. Uh, video games, 
photocopiers and dishwashers, flat panel TVs. These can also connect to the internet as well. So it's not just outputting images, but actually has the ability to have inputs. Already you can control them with remote controls and GPS systems. So as you can see, this sort of digital embedded system are definitely all around us and available to each of us and we're interacting with them commonly on a day-to-day -day basis. And so as good mechatronics engineers, it's important that you understand how these systems are working. You may have to design them or at least work with them or integrate them into some project that you're doing. And so this subject will give you a greater understanding of these.